afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our culminating performance for Stage Stories 2. This is one of our classes in the Creative Aging Program at the Wallace Annenberg Center for the Performing Arts. I'm Deborah Pascarette, the director of the program, and I am so proud of these students who are going to be bringing you some amazing stories this afternoon. So I welcome you to sit back, relax, and let yourself listen to their incredible words and and I would like to introduce the first person that's reading today, Marjorie. Thank you, Deborah. Hi, I'm Marjorie. Legs is the title of my story. <clears throat> Driving home from work, I was listening to K-Rock, minding my own business, when my tires began to spin on loose gravel. I felt like I had a loss of traction. The car was sliding and I could hear the sound of stretching metal. The back end of my Fiat lifted up and ended in a forward flip. I crash landed upside down. The car roof balanced on dusty asphalt with all four tires reaching for the sky as if they were in prayer position. Hanging upside down, I was terrified. My body weight resting on the safety belt prevented me from unbuckling, no matter how hard I tried. My skirt draped around my face as my naked butt covered only in legs pantyhose was on full display. Six, Rebar rods pierced the windshield, missing my face by inches. Stuck upside down, I struggled to get out. Frozen, there was no escape. A loud creaking noise alerted me that my car door was opening. A young man with strong arms reached around my torso. He lifted me up away from the seatbelt. Finally, I could press the release button. This was no time for me to be embarrassed that my bare bottom was exposed. Carefully, he held my body, turning me upright so I could stand as we exited the car. I trembled as I looked at the car I was just trapped in. It, it all came back to me, typical freeway traffic, construction of a wall in progress on the right shoulder, tons of exposed rebar. Out of nowhere, the car to the left squeezed in front of me. There wasn't any room. Instinctively, I braked and swerved right to avoid a crash. Like I was in a time warp, my car slowly rolled over. The cop on the scene escorted me to the emergency room. The stranger who saved me is also the guy who cut me off. I'm grateful, I'm angry, shaken to the core. I'm just happy to be alive. I'm pleased now to introduce our next writer, Constance. Hello, I'm Constance, and my story is The Neighbor. She lives across the narrow street below me. She camps out on the fire escape behind the building. I hear her both days and nights as she screams, curses, and has violent fights with spirits only she can see. Often she will throw off her, all of her clothes and run around the adjacent parking lot. She plays her boom box and enjoys practicing dramatic falls on the sidewalk. Today her boom box must be broken. No one notices her. She eventually gives up. She craves attention. 
There is a new expensive Pilates studio at the front of her building. She stands in front of its large windows and yells profanities at the students inside. Once she threw a can at a woman coming out of the Pilates studio. The police were called and arrested her. The next day she was back. She's still here every night, keeping me awake and pooping in the parking lot during the day. I had the stomach flu this week and lying in my bed, listening to her cursing and screaming is making me feel so much more pain. She owns the street. We are her captive audience. Yesterday, she stood in front of the Pilates studio screaming at the classes. Her favorite word is F-U-C-K. Then the owner of the property came to observe. Hmm, that evening, a private security guard appeared and forced her to leave. She was returned during the night. Hmm. She is a mad woman out of the Middle Ages, yet she lives in our politically correct, equity-enthused Los Angeles. She is the favorite race and sex of the alt-left. She should be, at the very least, our district council member. But she is a fact the woke will not address. There is no housing for her, no mental health facility, no food stamps, no health care. All the city will offer is allowing the landlord to employ a private security guard to chase her away on a daily basis. Our enlightened PC elected officials are waiting for her to die of exposure or starvation. This is really what I meant to say. And now I have the pleasure of inducing Andrea. Thank you. Hello there. My name is Andrea, and my story is a letter to my hometown. Dear Burbank, fuck you. You took a 10 year old girl from the warm embrace of Hollywood with self-confidence and popularity. You threw her into a foreign land, Burbank, California, 1953. No Latinos, no African-Americans, just a few scattered families of Jews. Until you came into my life, I didn't even know that being Jewish mattered. I entered Ozzy and Harriet world with no preparation. My immigrant parents wanted to own a home, $7,000, Burbank. Kids born of GIs returning home and suspicious of foreigners, wasps, devout church going Republicans. Sixth grade, once a week buses came to take my classmates to church. We eight kids were sent to a designated classroom. Christmas and Easter were celebrated in the auditorium. We were sent to that same segregated room. We were singled out as the ones who killed Christ, loudly acclaimed during lunch, while any table we sat at was pulled away, so it didn't touch one of theirs. Brave girls came up behind me and felt my head for horns. Really? In Burbank? I learned an entire new vocabulary on who I was. Sixth grade finally over, junior high. A new crop of kids and a few more of us. The overt harassment diminished somewhat. Yet even my parents 
were publicly disrespected by those same kids. When my mother drove some of us to a conference, these kids would mimic her accent. My parents had thicker skins. They had survived World War II in Europe and China. I survived, and yes, there was an upside. Through high school, I lived to prove I was as good, if not better. I overachieved in every way, best grades in every class, editor of the school paper and yearbook, award after award, but no prom date unless I imported one. Burbank, I will never forget you. Fuck you. Warm regards, Andrea. Hi, my name is Leslie, and this story is Cincinnati. Three brain surgeries so far. I'm being chased by renegade aneurysms. Anatomical landmines lying in wait. It's a sinister race. My condition rare and potentially unstoppable. Very few specialists worldwide. The nearest at Cleveland Clinic thousands of miles away. Unable to work steadily, I've lost so much so far, but my life, life on the line. It begins with a phone call to apply for a stipend. Destination, Cleveland. Airline reservations made months ago. Great organization, kudos. Now, reviewing the ticket, Cincinnati. What the fuck? My blood pressure soars and plummets. Haunted by lyrics of a song I remember from college. Just when you seem to have your life so well controlled, it slips away. I'm struggling to recall the songwriter. It doesn't matter, except it does to me. Not remembering is a symbol and symptom of my often tortured present. Brain struggling to comprehend and cooperate with basic tasks. This is my brain after life-changing traumatic brain injuries. Joni Mitchell's music drifts to me in the air. Laughing and crying, you know it's the same release. Breaking like the waves in Malibu. Then weirdly out of cyberspace, an iPhone video pops up on my screen. From Malibu, 1990. Scenes with my law school soulmate. Now she lives on the East Coast, I on the West. The next day, we're actually reuniting over a three hour lunch, floating together in our ocean of conversation, like two sailboats joining, swapping stories about civil rights and corporate law. Then she relays the wicked irony of her brilliant husband falling through a train platform. Their lives forever altered by the consequences of his traumatic brain injuries. With this revelation, I've stopped feeling isolated on my own island. I'm remembering study sessions we held in Boston by Emerson's Walden Pond and the prescient plaque there reminding us that every wall is a door. And now I'd like to introduce our next talented writer, Sherry. Thank you, Leslie. Hi, I'm Sherry. And the piece I'm reading today is a letter to my hometown called Dear Emporia, Kansas. It's been a long time since we last spoke. In fact, you're probably wondering whatever happened to that young girl, Sherry Ann, eldest daughter of Dottie and Clay McCoy. As you'll recall, I came to live in Emporia in 1951 when I was only four years old. And my little sister, Donna Kay, was just a baby in the first year of her life. We moved into a nice two bedroom house right next door to the stockyards, cattle barns, and the Longhorn Cafe, 
where all the cowboys went to eat and have coffee after the co cattle sales. Black coffee, of course, because real men don't put no cream in their coffee. And porterhouse steaks so big they fell off the sides of the platter. Hardly left any room for the baked potato and sour cream, let alone the big slice of apple pie for dessert. All for less than two bucks. Not a bad deal, I suppose, unless you're a vegetarian. Folks in Emporia didn't take kindly to people who thought different, you know, had ideas of their own, independent thinkers, radicals, especially if you were of the female persuasion. That was frowned upon. A woman's place was in the home as wife and mother. Stir too far from that mold and you might find yourself in a heap of trouble. That's what it said in the Bible. So everyone said, but I digress. First chance I got, I hightailed it out of Emporia and moved to New York City, where I had hopes of becoming a famous model like Twiggy. Things didn't work out like I'd planned though, probably for the best. I guess sometimes it takes a lifetime to realize that wherever you go, there you are. Sincerely, Sherry Ann. And now I'd like to introduce our next uh, writer, Aviva. Thank you, Sherry. My name is Aviva. The title of my story is Valerie Matsejo. There's a door in my mind behind which shame hides. Tentatively, I tap, tap till it opens. I see Valerie Matsejo, a Sutu woman from the grasslands of Africa. Her round mud hut in Botswana stands empty. She is cleaning a large brick house with a lush green garden, a sapphire swimming pool. As she works, she rocks and sings softly a lullaby. Tula tu, tula sana, tula baba. Be silent, baby. Keep silent. She is well practiced. She knows how to keep the baby on her back very quiet. Her madam is home. I take a closer look. Now aware that the child tightly wrapped on her back is not hers. Milky white. It's been 43 days, her own child abruptly weaned, dropped off a long five hour bus ride away. Relatives must help relatives these days. A sad bus ride back to Johannesburg. Breasts overflow. Valerie Matsejo migrant laborer, servant, is always alert. The table bell summons. She carries a tray filled with fresh food to the dining room where the family sits waiting. Steamy bread rolls dipped in creamy soup. Later, she will clean the table, return the dishes to their rightful place and lick the morsels off the plates. I think to myself, as a child, did I ever get a turn to ring that bell? Did I get to see Valerie Matsejo shuffle towards me, bearing my burdens, carrying my plates? 
Valerie Matsejo, a Sutu woman from the grasslands of Africa, will never see the ocean. She will never have a window in her dark room in the servants' quarters. She will never learn to read or write. But Valerie Matsejo has some great achievements. She helped raise three children. One is a pharmacist. One is a CEO of an international corporation. And the third lives in America, where she writes about a door in her mind. Now it is my pleasure to introduce our final writer, Eileen. Thank you, Aviva. My name is Eileen, and the title of my story is What I Meant to Say. 18-year-old Paul Levine from down the street tells me he will give me some beer if I give him a blowjob. I don't know what a blowjob is, but I want the beer, so I say yes. What I meant to say is I'm 12 years old, and I don't know why you're asking me this, but I want the beer. I am on a trip to Lake Arrowhead with my Benebrith Girls chapter, of which I am president. How that happened, I have no idea, but I am living a very double life. I wander off by myself and start flirting with the parking lot attendant, who takes me to his house, where we drink and end up in bed. We fuck, and I bleed. What I meant to say is, I'm a 15-year-old virgin, but I say nothing because things have progressed this far and I'm drunk and I don't want to disappoint. I never see him again. I run away to a commune in Eastern Washington with a guy whose name I don't remember. Truly one of the dumbest decisions of my life. What I meant to say is I don't want to live on a godforsaken farm, but I'd go anyway. He leaves me after a week on the farm. I end up living in Spokane in an apartment with this weird couple. The wife exchanges sexual favors for other favors from a much older man. She asks me if I want to go. I say yes, because there are things I need. He asks me what I want. I suppose I could have said a car. But I say I want a fifth of vodka, a carton of Marlboro Reds, and 20 bucks. What I meant to say is, I'm 19, and you are an old, disgusting man. But I don't, because I want the goods. I am a teenage alcoholic. No is rarely part of my vocabulary. I get sober at 24 but it takes a very long time for me to change my modus operandi, mainly in the area of sex. I find that drinking is not necessary for me to degrade myself. I aspire to low self-esteem. I finally get to the anger stage where I am able to say, get your fucking hands off of me and mean it. This does not last forever, but it is what it takes to break the spell. I am now an old lady. I almost always say what I mean and mean what I say. And if I don't do it immediately, I always call back to say what I mean to say. The path to redemption for some of us takes a very long time. And I have forgiven my 12 and 15 and 19 year old selves. At 72, I have assumed full ownership of my person, and it feels damn good. And now I'd like to ask Deborah to come back to close out our program. Thank you so much, Eileen. And I'd like to invite all of the writers back 
so we can have a virtual round of applause for all of you. So you can't hear it, but you know they're applauding when they're listening to your stories. What a great afternoon of storytelling. I want to thank everyone who has tuned in to watch this recording. We are so happy to share our stories with you. We have many classes at the Wallace Sandenberg Center for the Performing Arts and our Creative Aging Program, and Stage Stories is just one of them. So I hope everyone has a great morning, noon, or night, depending on when you're watching this. And thank you so much. Take care.